Hello, I'm Jerry Henwood, and welcome to Let's Talk About It. Today I have the privilege of interviewing a young woman named Amy Gustitis. And Amy has been a registered nurse. Uh, she's also a lawyer. And one of the things that Amy does is to give some expert and needed advice as a caregiver consultant. And what exactly that means, we're going to find out now. Amy, welcome to the show. It's nice to have you. Thank you, Jerry. Thank sure. you for having me. Sure. Now, this title, Caregiver Consultant, what exactly does that mean? Well, caregivers oftentimes are faced with many types of decisions for their loved ones. Um, they could be financial, they could be uh, property related, they could be legal related or clinically related. And oftentimes um, it can be a little bit overwhelming in terms of trying to figure out how to come up with a plan of care and a plan of action to go forward. Um, when we're discharged from the hospital or when we leave the doctor's office, oftentimes we're given discharge paperwork, but that really just scratches the surface of the kind of help and the kind of coordination that people need. So my goal is to empower families and caregivers and their loved ones to be able to take ownership of their life and to be able to figure out what kind of quality of life that they can live, um, you know, given their diagnosis and given the constraints of what they have in front of them. Is this a relatively new role that you've, you've created or assumed? Well, caregiver consulting has been around for a while. Um, I think it's evolved in particular over the last few years because there's been an increase in lifespan. And we have people not just living longer, but living longer with chronic illnesses. Um, such as uh, dementia or Parkinson's. Um, so with that comes uh, many more decisions and there's complexity involved with perhaps you thought you would stay in your home for the rest of your life when in fact your home is no longer a, a safe and comfortable place and you need to find new housing. Um, or perhaps you're no longer able to make decisions for yourself. So you need to meet with an attorney and get a power of attorney put in place to help you make decisions. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, it's multifactorial what's involved and that you can imagine uh, oftentimes the caregiver themselves might not be feeling so well. Um, so they too have to attend to themselves and to their needs. So it's a balance between making sure that we take care of the caregiver as well as the loved one who has the illness. Now, uh, it was seven years ago that my own husband uh, passed away and I had been his caregiver for five years. Uh, no one, either in a nursing facility or in a hospital, ever mentioned to me the caregiver consultant role. Uh, I would have uh, benefited from some advice that you could have offered me because many of the things I had to learn on my own and figure out on my own. Mm -hmm. Now, what led you to this position of caregiver consultant? Well, I've had experience working in long-term care facilities, home health care, hospice, assisted living, and in schools. And throughout my time there, um, I'm uh, often, I wind up not just taking care of the, the students or the patients with whom I'm assigned, but also uh, I wind up caring for the caregiver because that's truly the person that is going to um, enable the, the patient to have the best quality of life. Um, so it's, it seems to me that there was sort of a gap in the system. Most of the conversations I had would be in a hallway on the run or you know somebody would be just stopping by to visit their loved one and they'd say, hey, I need, just need you to answer a few questions. And the way the system is set up currently with um, social workers and discharge planners and whatnot, uh, they're just overwhelmed. Uh, they don't have the time or the resources to truly do the, the full um, gamut of what needs, uh, what people need to know upon discharge. So it's up to caregivers, unfortunately, to see if they can find what they need in terms of caregiver consultants or other resources. Um, but to your point, it, you know, sometimes you get left out and it's very lonely and can be extremely overwhelming because you're faced with so many decisions and people really aren't forthcoming with information. 
And mm -hmm. it sort of leaves the caregiver in a bit of a bind because they have this huge responsibility, but they don't even know where to begin to seek the answers that they need. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in reading your background information, uh, I think most people would think of caregivers of end-of-life situations, mm -hmm. but that's not the case, is it? Could you tell us what other categories of caregiving that um, you deal with? Sure. Well, uh, we'll start at the early end of the spectrum. Uh, with parents who have children with special needs, um, there's many pediatric uh, clients who need someone to assist them in terms of developing a care management plan. Um, oftentimes they're followed by a physician's office um, as well as they're getting the support from perhaps a social worker uh, within the school they attend or within the system. Um, but sometimes they need more help than that. And sometimes the issues are uh, broader than what their, their current um, interdisciplinary team can manage. You might run into a property issue where you know, you, you, had this, you had children thinking, well, we're going to stay here forever, but your child with special needs um, is not able to be comfortable and to be safe in the house that you're in, so you might need to move or consider other living accommodations for your child. Um, and if you, you know, go forward along the age uh, spectrum, um, we, can, uh, we work with people who have chronic illnesses, um, with wounded warriors, um, as well as people who are aging or at the end of life. Uh, because some people, you know, they, they might have an early onset illness, like a cancer or something that just really uh, creates for them a lifetime of disability. Um, or perhaps somebody sustained a traumatic brain injury in a car accident. And if that's the case, they have, um, you know, they have a tough road ahead of them because now they have to figure out and let go of the life they thought they were going to live and now reinvent themselves. I, I hear what you're saying. And uh, for many of us, we, because we're not faced with caregiving responsibilities for the mm -hmm. most part during our lifetime, except uh, uh, if we have a child who mm -hmm. needs special attention, if we have a loved one who's just come back from a war, as you said, with mm -hmm. traumatic brain injury, car accidents. Mm -hmm. um, so there are many categories of caregiving that's required. Now, um, given all the categories that we've been talking about, it's obvious to me now why there's a need for your services. But when did you realize that there was a need for such services? How long have you been doing this? Well, I've been doing this for about five years now. Um, prior to that, I was actively working uh, full-time within the healthcare system. Um, but slowly I've started to branch out on my own and to create my own organization that focuses primarily on caring for the caregiver. Um, and what I do currently is I work with individuals and I work with groups and families and I meet with them in their home or I meet with them in un maybe a, another clinical setting, let's say their loved ones in a long-term care uh, community, we could meet there. And we just come up with a sense of come up with an assessment of where people are, how they are doing, what their goals are, uh, what their, their hopes are for their loved ones so that we can maintain the dignity of the situation. Mm -hmm. Well, given that um, in this country we have such a crisis going on with health care, mm -hmm. uh, how it, are your services funded? Uh, do people privately employ you? Is any of it covered by any insurance? Right now at this time, I just accept private pay clients. Uh, it's just because for right now, that's the way that I'm set up. Um, you can get a doctor's order for care management and you can work through a care management uh, consulting company. Um, that depends upon your diagnosis and uh, there's, there's a whole host of factors that go into the situation. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, for some people, it's helpful because they get you know, they, they're comfortable paying for an attorney or they're comfortable paying for their accountant or perhaps a financial advisor. And the caregiver consultant is a natural complement to that team of people. So initially people might think, well, why do I have to pay for this? You know, this should be something that should be funded. I would agree with that. But at this time, um, you know, you can, I can meet with you for maybe an, a few hours here and then, you know, we can have a few follow-up sessions and you're able to walk away with a real-time plan of care for your loved one that you would have had to otherwise go to see an attorney, an accountant, a real estate agent, um, a banker, um, 
a social worker. And not that those people still wouldn't continue to be part of your life, but what people really need is a quarterback, somebody to step back and take a look at the big picture and to say, okay, I hear your situation, I understand, and here we're, we're going to triage the issues that you have in your life. And this is where I see the biggest issue is and work from there and then help people identify the resources that they need so that they can move forward and, and build the team that they need to be able to keep their loved one safe and comfortable. That, that's very interesting because, again, speaking from personal experience, mm -hmm. uh, I was my husband's advocate, but nobody was my advocate. Exactly. And so. if you go down, the whole system goes down. And that's why it's so important for caregivers to have somebody that's just in their corner alone that's advocating for them. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think for the viewer's information, I'd like to uh, do a case study with them. Okay. And say, given that uh, you help in the area of the, the clinical, uh, the financial, and the legal. Mm -hmm. So can you think of a case study, a, a typical example, mm -hmm. maybe someone at the end of life, okay. uh, and give us perhaps an idea of how you helped someone who was a caregiver and you came in and you address those categories, or if not at the end of life, pediatric, or any other case study that you might be able to think of sure. that would highlight for the viewer <clears throat> Uh, a specific case study in which you were helpful in those areas? Absolutely. Um, I can uh, come up with a scenario where, uh, let's say a husband is taking care of his wife and she was diagnosed with de dementia maybe five years ago. And within that diagnosis, uh, they were able to stay within their home and he was able to care for his wife but now they're reaching the point where he, she can't be left alone anymore. So instead of it being some juggling in terms of, okay, I can leave my loved one home alone for an hour or I can have a friend come, um, the spouse really needed to have more of a care team on site to make sure that his wife was kept safe and that they had a continuity of care while they were able to stay in their house. Um, so initially, you know, I would go in and I would meet with a family and I tend to uh, prefer to go to people's homes to go where they are because then I can get a sense of what their living style is like, what their living conditions are, what's their normal because I'd like ideally to keep that in place because most people want to age in their home. They don't necessarily want to leave. Um, so I can then assess what the strengths are of that situation and we can capitalize on those. Um, from that, I would then go into trying to understand legally where they, uh, where they are in terms of their estate planning. Have they met with an elder care attorney? Are they interested in that? Because at this point, uh, it would be extremely important to make sure that the power of attorney is in place for uh, the husband to have the power of attorney over the wife because as her uh, capacity continues to diminish, she's not going to be able to make decisions. And it's much harder to get the power of attorney situation cleared up after your loved one has become diminished in their capacity. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just more cumbersome and complicated and more expensive. Um, so ideally, you'd like to get out in front of this um, and you'd, you would want to designate power, powers of attorney. So from there, right there, we've already talked about some real estate issues, we've talked about legal issues, and uh, financially, people would, would try and decide, are they able to stay in their home? If they are, what is it that they need to do financially to remain in their home? And then on top of that, obviously, the most important, what, what, what really drives this whole train is the clinical needs of the situation. Because as somebody begins to clinically change, then the situation needs to adapt to this person. So clinically, we would need to assess, does this person need uh, a caregiver to come in maybe and help with activities of daily living, such as bathing or laundry, uh, feeding, those sorts of activities. Um, so again, we're going, we're looking through the lens of clinical, but that's really a financial issue and a legal issue in terms of who makes the choices and who's going to pay for these things. Um, it's, each situation is, is different and unique in that Medicare might pay for some, you know, there might be some insurance coverage for certain things. Mm -hmm. um, some things might need to be paid for privately. Um, so it, it just depends on the situation. Um, so, so ultimately, we want to constantly keep safety is the, the, in the forefront. That's the most important factor of all. 
And that's not just safety of the, of the patient, it would be safety for the caregiver as well. Because if they feel that you know, they're not sleeping or they're not eating or they're just emotionally becoming more and more drained, then that's not good for anybody. So even though we have uh, a patient in the, in the situation, it's really a family support system that we're developing. And everybody's family looks different. It might be a husband, it might be a neighbor who's taking care of somebody, it might be a, a relative or a friend or a child. But at the end of the day, it's a group of people who care about each other and want to see what's best. So my goal is that I try and maintain the dignity of the situation and to empower the people to do what makes them feel like they're giving their loved one the best care possible. It's interesting that you picked that particular case study because I have very close friends mm -hmm. where uh, the woman was diagnosed six years ago mm -hmm. and her husband said to her at that time, don't worry, I will take care of you. Six years later, I've seen the deterioration and the sources of anxiety for the husband who's the caregiver mm -hmm. and his increasing frustration. Mm -hmm. And so a service like yours, I think, is very valuable because it's an objective voice that comes in and looks at the whole situation mm -hmm. and is there for both uh, the person who uh, is considered the patient mm -hmm. as well as for the caregiver. Mm -hmm. Now, how often do you, in a situation like that, um, confer with the caregiver and, and perhaps the family members? Well, in a situation that's stable or more in a holding pattern, um, we can roll it out in a, you know, a, I guess maybe we'll have a, an hour or two initial assessment, and then we can have some follow-up meetings based upon the needs. Um, for some people, I meet them in crisis. So we might spend several hours initially over a period of, of a few days to get things settled, and then we sort of back off a little bit and we have uh, you know, a little bit more of a monitoring situation as opposed to being in crisis. Mm -hmm. um, I always like to use the, the phrase, time is choices. So if you find yourself where you're in a holding pattern and your loved one you know has a, a, a chronic condition and at some point you know they're going to decline, it's best to act now because at that point, you do have the ability to say, okay, well, this is the kind of care I'd like my loved one to receive, or this is where I'd like for us to live, or this is the kind of agency I'd like to work with, or this is the doctor I want to connect with. Once the crisis hits, all of a sudden, all the choices are off the table, and you just are left with whatever is there. And that can be so frustrating to families because they're overwhelmed and they don't even realize that they're in a holding pattern and that they could be making these choices. There's just a, a lack of awareness out there that um, if they had a support system, while things are relatively calm, that's gonna be able to see them through the, the decline of their loved one, which it's sad and it's inevitable, but there is a way to do it with grace and with dignity. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, my particular friends mm -hmm. live in Lackawanna County. What geographical area in the Delaware Valley or beyond do you serve? Well, I'm, I'm willing to, to travel to, to meet people where they are. Mm -hmm. um, you know, ideally, I would like to serve the five county region, but certainly there are many cases where someone is out of state and their loved one is local here. So their out of state loved one will be calling me and saying, can you please go check on my, my mother, see how she's doing and help us come up with a plan so that they, the person who's out of state has boots on the ground, if you will, and that they know that they have an advocate there to keep an eye on things and to go to the plan of care meetings at the living community or to attend to a doctor's appointment with a loved one so that there's somebody gathering real-time information and then that information can be transmitted back to the, the loved one who's out of state. Um, but to your question, if the, the client is located outside of the region, I would be happy to work with them. It just would be a remote situation. Mm -hmm. um, but with the, the way technology is now, I mean, we can accomplish many things with conference calls and, um, you know, video chatting and whatnot. That's something that we can easily do because right. most of it is about um, helping somebody create a team of people mm -hmm. so that they feel supported. And mm -hmm. we can do that uh, in person and we can do it remotely as well. Right. Now, 
if from your point of view, uh, when is, is there an ideal time for a caregiver to contact you? I'm thinking of somebody who is diagnosed with Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and they know where that's going to progress eventually mm -hmm. in a few years. Mm -hmm. uh, so given that scenario, mm -hmm. is, it, is it a matter of contacting you when the caregiver uh, begins to become frustrated or before then or what, what would you advise? Well, it's a great question because it seems like it's you, you want to put it off because once you start acknowledging that you need a caregiving consultant, then it makes it real. So to try and um, wade into that area gently, one of the services I offer is grief counseling. And prior to losing our loved one or in any kind of um, situation that's, that causes a sadness or trauma, people have anticipatory grief, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Mm -hmm. And that what I do in the beginning is to meet with people and to discuss how they're doing with their diagnosis. How are they doing with their changing role as a caregiver? No longer are they now a spouse caring for a spouse. They've now become the parent and the spouse has become the child. And as you can imagine, that's just one example. There's many examples like that. Um, but you can imagine the amount of grief that is stirred up. And one way that I find that's very successful is to sit down and to, to talk from an emotional perspective. How are you doing? Where are you, you know, emotionally with this? And from that emotional conversation, people then, we develop a, a trust relationship and there's a level of, of um, you know, we just get to know each other a little bit, we understand the situation. And because they trust you, then they start to tell you about the practical realities of their life, which then lead to us coming out with a plan of care that would then meet their needs. I see. The other question I have for you is that um, part of caregiving very often, especially when you're alone, mm -hmm. if you have the time and you realize that not all nursing homes are the same, mm -hmm. not all agencies that come into the home are the same, mm -hmm. do you as a caregiver consultant have you evaluated different places and therefore can say to a caregiver, I would recommend these agencies above these because I would uh, recommend these nursing homes above these because when I was told just three days before discharge from a nursing home mm -hmm. that, um, or rather from the, uh, the trauma center uh, where my husband had been receiving occupational and physical therapy mm -hmm. uh, for a, a break. Uh, we're going to discharge in three days. Uh, tell us where you want us to send him. Mm -hmm. A caregiver has had no experience with that. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I had the time to go around and investigate, go visit, and there were certainly facilities that I wouldn't think of sending my husband. Mm -hmm. Now, in your situation as a caregiver consultant, uh, do you have those kinds of recommendations? I do have recommendations. Mm -hmm. um, but in the interest of fairness to the agencies that are out there, um, a, one rotten apple can spoil the whole bunch, if you will. Yeah. And that sometimes there's, and not just sometimes, many times in healthcare, there are a lot of miscommunications because healthcare agencies by nature are understaffed, which is an unfortunate reality. When I worked in long-term care, I would have 30 to 40 patients myself and maybe two or three nurse, um, nursing assistants who would be providing you know, the day-to-day -day showering, bathing, toileting of people. You can imagine how well that goes. Right. And that is common across the board in terms of you know, no matter what uh, kind of community you go in, those kind of staff ratios are an unfortunate reality. Um, especially with shift work, you're going to find that not only is there maybe not enough staff, but that the staff changes. So you might develop a relationship with one person and then the next shift is a completely different person, mm -hmm. which may or may not work. Right. Um, and in terms of agencies, it's, it's a similar experience. Like you're, you're hiring people who want to do a good job, but they're going into a stranger's home and they might not necessarily be comfortable because they don't want to do anything to offend you or they don't want to be accused of doing something wrong so they might be a little bit error on the side of being more introverted and 
in the meantime, the person who hired them is thinking, why aren't you doing something? Mm -hmm. When all it is is it was just a miscommunication. Mm -hmm. And that I think once people get more comfortable with having someone in their home or working with um, an outpatient facility or whatever the, whatever the resource is, it's really at the end of the day about communication. Mm -hmm. um, now that's not to say that maybe, you know, there are definitely some places that have a better reputation than others, but um, I wouldn't necessarily just look online at ratings. I, you know, have many, many contacts in the industry, so I would make some phone calls and ask for some firsthand experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, another option that I encourage people to consider is to attend in caregiver support groups. Um, I run them throughout the uh, Delaware and Chester County and Montgomery County region. Um, they're monthly and you can come to one group or you can come to all of them. And it's an opportunity where you can sit with other caregivers and the, the best part of it is you can exchange the wisdom and the resources that worked for them and they had success with. So it's not just me the third party saying, I think you should do X, Y, and Z, you're actually talking to people who in real time are, are working with an agency or working with a, a, a company. And they can say, I talked to this person on this day, here's the phone number, or you know what, I didn't have such a good experience. I'd, I'd, rec I'd not recommend that. So it's not just me who would be uh, determining or you know funneling that the resources. Mm -hmm. Most of the resource, uh, referrals come from the caregivers themselves to one another. Mm -hmm. And and that's a very uh, good point because uh, you, uh, I have always, uh, when you think about uh, looking for painters or plumbers or electricians, mm -hmm. I go to my neighbors. Yes. Who would you recommend? And I can see the value of a support group in that situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So th that's that's another very good uh, uh, service that uh, you provide. Thank yeah. you. Um, well, one of the uh, another thing about uh, the caregiver help, the home health aides who come in, mm -hmm. is that sometimes there could be a personality conflict uh, where someone, the patient, has always prided himself or herself on being independent. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, you have somebody <laughs> who comes in and begins to dictate. Mm -hmm. uh, you need to do this. You need to do that, mm -hmm. and that was that was an experience I had, mm -hmm. and I was fortunate enough to find someone who was a much better fit. But again, I I had to do that, and, and I think that's really you. You just answered. You just provided a beautiful example of this is how it works. Is you you know a, a family hires an agency or a, you know some sort of professional, and that person comes into their personal space. And they're in their bedroom, in their personal bathroom with their loved one. I mean, it's it's very awkward. It just, it wasn't supposed to be like this. For many years, we operated just fine without anybody coming into our personal <laughs> space. And now we have this stranger. And that person, um, you know, most, the, when they're professional people, they come in and they understand that there's a level, everybody's a little uncomfortable. And they can withstand some uh, verbal animosity they appreciate that people are um, maybe embarrassed or ashamed because they feel like they've failed because their body is failing. Mm -hmm. And my experience is with most professionals, they do very well in terms of trying to restore that person's dignity. And it winds up being a beautiful opportunity to have a relationship and that good things can come from that. But to your point, absolutely, if that person doesn't work for you, then it's absolutely appropriate for you to say, you know what, I think we need a different person here. Mm -hmm. And any good agency or any situation is going to respond to your needs and, and give you what you need and, and find a good match for you. Well, Amy, I just wish that you I had known about you when <laughs> I could have benefited from a caregiver consultant. Oh, I wish uh, I knew about you too and your <laughs> husband, yeah. But in the meantime, we hope that you, the viewers, uh, have enjoyed and benefited from the information that was shared today. And Amy, thank you so much for coming in and taking your time to do so. And the best of luck to you. Thank you, Jerry. It was a sure. pleasure to be here. Thank you. Mm -hmm.